right, good evening everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, we are talking WAN technologies tonight. Let's take a look at the, um, let's take a look at the exam list. How are we doing so far? So we have already covered quite a few things. We've covered LAN switching technologies, routing technologies. Last week, for those who may not have gotten to, to check in, we, we talked about OSPF, we talked about EIGRP, um, the differences between distance vector and link state protocols. That was a pretty exciting uh, topic, <laughs> if I can say that, about uh, CCNA topics. But um, routing OSPF and EIGRP, that always gets pretty fun. So tonight we're talking about WAN technologies, and Cisco expects us to know quite a bit. So I don't think in an hour and a half we're going to be able to cover everything in here. But we're going to cover, I think, some of the things that I find to be the most important. Um, first of all, we need to understand point-to-point -point protocol and even the PPPOE, the point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet, if we can make an acronym that long, uh, configuration. They want us to understand that. And um, then we're also, they sneak it in down here at 3.6, but guess what? We do need to understand a little bit about the border gateway protocol, BGP. So we're going to make sure that we hit those up tonight. And then if you have any questions about anything else um, that maybe we're not going to end up covering or what have you, I mean, I want to make this... Um, you know, as valuable for you as possible. So be sure to check that out. So we have here a, um, you know, just a little bit going on here. Like I said, we're going to do some PPP, PPPOE configuration as well. So I've got the lab environment spun up. Um, the unfortunate thing about this lab, I'm going to have to look into it a little bit. Um, it caught me by surprise. We don't have any serial links available to us in this lab. So I'm not going to be able to do the PPP direct configuration, but we will take a look at PPPOE uh, client side configuration, which is what Cisco uh, wants us to know. Hey, Gus, thanks for uh, thanks, thanks for joining. <laughs> All right, and um, let's see here. What else we got? BGP. Yes, we're going to configure BGP again. Cisco doesn't want us to know a lot about BGP for CCNA, but the the purpose is that as we progress and as we go up that staircase and we start with CCNA and we go to CCNP. Um, whether you ever hit CCNP or CCIE level doesn't matter. It's just a foundational level of BGP. So we'll talk a little bit about what makes BGP special and um, and kind of go from there, do a little bit of configuration as well. And then the WAN connectivity options, that would be if we go back a moment to the, um, to these, well, what's going on here? There we go. Um, these topics here, the, um, where are we here? Yes, right here. Describe WAN topology options. So talking about these different options and, oh, you know, I think uh, this is specifically why I wanted to cover. Make sure we understand the differences between MPLS, Metro Ethernet, etc. So with that, let's dive in to talking about the point-to-point -point protocol. So um, when we have... Hello, pen. There we go. When we have two routers trying to communicate over a serial link, we have to keep a couple of things in mind. Um, the most important of which is that we cannot run Ethernet over a serial link. It's it's not based on the Ethernet protocol. So the, the pins out and in and everything like that, what it boils down to is that we need to have a different layer two protocol. Now, I don't know how many of you have spun up two routers in a lab that happen to have a serial interface. I mean, it's it's almost too easy. Uh, you know, you do a no shut on both sides and then you give it an IP address and boom, you're you're off and pinging. You know, I mean, in fact, you don't even have to do any kind of ARP, you know, so when you configure an Ethernet interface, you start doing some pings. A lot of times what ends up happening is you do a ping and you have to wait a couple of steps and you don't even know if it's going to work. But then all of a sudden the ARP finishes and we get all of our you know, exclamation points for a successful ping, right? That's what we're aiming for. But with a serial interface, boom, it's just up, it's working. We don't have to worry about any of that. But what we don't realize is that, at least in the Cisco world, underneath the hood, we're running a protocol called HDLC, which I believe is high level or high late, I think it's high level data link control protocol. So the HDLC is, and it's a special Cisco flavor of HDLC as well. And this is essentially providing the services that Ethernet normally does for us, meaning that as packets come in, 
um, you know, basically we think about collisions uh, that Ethernet manages for us. We think about, well, you know, with, with serial links, we don't have to worry about collisions, fortunately. But it's just, I think that's maybe the point. There's, with Ethernet, all talking, multiple access, right? We could have a thousand different devices on a single Ethernet link. We could have, um, you know, we, we could have collisions. We, we, we've got VLANs. We've got so much that we have to worry about with Ethernet. And with layer, layer two on a serial link, there's not as much that we have to worry about. So there's not a whole lot of magic sauce to HDLC. And so we never really have to do anything with it. And I think that's the, call it the danger of configuring serial links is we forget that there's a lot going on underneath the configuration, like the IP address information that's making that all work. So Cisco doesn't really want us to study HDLC a whole lot. They want us to study this concept of what we call the point to point protocol or PPP, all right? So PPP is essentially going to serve the same function as HDLC, except it's going to give us a couple of extra features. Okay, the first big feature that PPPP gives us is authentication. Our ability to send usernames and passwords back and forth up here is going to be very, very, well, it's something HDLC doesn't allow us to do. So if I have two, you know, let's say I'm a bank and I'm going to establish a serial connection out to an ATM. I've got a router in the middle of nowhere and the only thing I can drop in there is a T1 link and I need to establish a connection to that. Well, what I don't want to have happen is for somebody to use a crowbar and rip open the ATM and you'd think they'd be going for the money, but for whatever reason in this scenario, they're going for the router and they, they pull that router out and put their own router in, okay? So um, at that point, the connection comes back up maybe and, and life is good. Well, that would be it would be great in that scenario for us to understand and realize that, okay, that, um, that router actually just went down um, and, and was replaced by something that can no longer attach. And the way we do that is with authentication. So if our routers are communicating by, again, having this concept of, you know, exchanging username and password when it comes up, well, when they put their new router in, it won't have that capability. It won't have the username and password to send, to upload to the, um, to the other router. Okay, so this is where authentication can, can come into play. So PPP gives us that capability, again, where HDLC does not. The other interesting thing that PPP, PPP gives us, I'm gonna erase a little bit here, uh, there we go, is we can take, come on, there we go, multiple T1s, multiple serial links, whatever we have going on there, and we can, in a way, in a weird way, bundle them together. Keep in mind, when we're bundling connections, we talked about this earlier with Ethernet, when we're bundling connections, there's a lot of magic that has to happen as far as you know, picking our, our links to send traffic on, potential fragmentations, we're talking about spanning tree BPDUs and such. So there's a lot that has to happen. And HDLC, again, HDLC is not able to take care of that. High level data link control protocol. Gus just confirmed it. Thank you, Gus. Appreciate that. <laughs> Always good to have confirmation on those kinds of things. So what we can do is this is this is called multi-link PPP. And it effectively is an ether channel. It, it, the difference pretend, well, actually there is no difference there. I was gonna say there there we uh, we create a logical interface called a multi-link interface within the router, and then that effectively sits behind this uh, these layer two connections. So whereas normally, remember my, my dot thing where, hey, a dot represents a layer three interface. Normally in this scenario, we'd have had three physical layer three interfaces. So we had three separate dots, right? And then we're relying on load balancing at the layer three level, which isn't a bad thing, by the way. Um, so when we get rid of that, we put that all behind a single layer three interface on the router. And that enables us to do it on both sides. And again, just like an ether channel, now we have one IP address, one subnet that we're consuming. So I don't know how much value there is with that. You know, it just depends on the organization where you are and what you're doing there. But, uh, you know, it, we will at least have an option to do it. So uh, and that's what PPP gives us is this multi-link. Make sure, okay, again, you can see that. Multi-link. 
All right, so um, that that is kind of that. I mean, that, that's what Cisco wants us to understand about the point-to-point -point protocol, um, as far as serial links are concerned. I believe. Let me go ahead and check, take one quick look at the exam blueprint. It says configure and verify PPP and ML PPP. So that's our multi-link point-to-point -point protocol on WAN interfaces using local authentication. Okay, so this is where unfortunately, uh, I, I because my lab doesn't support the serial links, we're not going to be able to do this. But there are a ton of examples online of what this configuration looks like, and it's not it's not that bad. I mean, you basically get onto the interface saying encapsulation PPP with multi-link. There's a little bit more configuration that you have to do to make it work, but um, in the end, there's uh, you know, it, it's just a couple of extra lines of configuration. So it's uh, generally speaking, I will say, if, in my experience, it's best practice to configure PPP on serial links. I know in a lot of cases, we just like to um, leave it alone, <laughs> leave it as HDLC, um, and we don't, you know, we don't touch it. But PPP gives us more options, um, including, by the way, compression and QoS services that we don't necessarily get on HDLC. So it's definitely worth taking a look at PPP next time you have a, um, a WAN link up configuration, install, whatever it is that you're doing to uh, bring up a WAN link. Okay, so I don't see any questions coming in on that. If you have any questions, please ask. Now's the time to do it. Let's move on to point to point protocol over ethernet. So all this is great. Let me refresh the whiteboard here. There we go. So all this is, this is great, but there are again, some cool features with point to point protocol. And you know, we don't always have the ability. I mean, we're not always running this over his WAN links over serial links. We might actually have a scenario where we have a router, maybe a service provider router that's sitting in our data center. And they, these days they like to just hand off an ethernet connection. And so they say, okay, we're going to give you this ethernet connection. And whether it's your initiative or the service provider's initiative, you go about saying, you know what? We want point to point protocol um, to, to run over this ethernet link. So that is point to point protocol over ethernet. Why do we want to do that? Usually it comes down to that authentication concept. Again, if it's in my own data center, I'm less concerned about maybe somebody swapping out that router, but yeah, you just you just want to be careful. You want to make sure that this connection is intentional. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Nobody has messed with it. And so to have username and password on both sides and be able to exchange those authentication parameters, it, it, that's the value that we get out of running PPPoE for the most part. Um, you do get a little bit of compression and this and that. Again, those QoS services that we talked about, but you get some of those on Ethernet anyways. So this is where... You know, it's less useful, but again, that authentication concept, there's really no equivalent of that on just straight up Ethernet. You can always do things like 802.1x and such, but that's more infrastructure facing, less point to point, hey, we're bringing this up. Um, by the way, one thing to keep in mind in all this, point to point protocol should imply something, which is that this is for point to point links. So if we have an Ethernet segment here and we're all on a VLAN and we've got three routers, I mean, that's not what this scenario is for because, you know, running point to point protocol, <laughs> we're not going to, it is a point to point connection between two routers. Okay. So the interesting thing, and this, this can be intimidating, but don't let it intimidate you. Uh, we're going to use something called a dialer interface on our client. And I guess I should specify that as well. We're going to have, whoops a host side configuration, which is going to usually be the service provider. And we'll have a client, can I spell? Client side um, configuration. So this looks very different. On the host side, we use what's called a virtual template interface. And the, com the, the configuration is a little bit more complicated. Fortunately, again, take a look. What does Cisco want us to learn? PPPoE client side. So we do not have to worry about the server side, which again is a little more complicated. Um, but, oops. So in our case, let's just worry about the client side, fortunately. 
So this dialer interface is going to have the PPP encapsulation configured under it. And it's going to, generally speaking, say, okay, you know what I want is to receive an IP address. So this is going to be a DHCP configuration. We actually use a uh, command that says IP address negotiated rather than what we usually use on the ethernet link to receive DHCP, which is IP address DHCP. <laughs> so negotiated. And then we're going to apply that dialer configuration. Um, there's a couple of other commands and we'll, we'll showcase this in the, in the demo. We're going to apply this to the interface, whatever that is. Maybe it's gig zero zero on the interface. And we'll, we'll apply the dialer command here with a, or a, a configuration here with a special command. So that's how we configure the client side. And that's what Cisco wants us to configure because from Cisco's perspective, what, what this entire section is, and we're going to see this with BGP later, is that they're only expecting us to really have control over one side of this connection. The, the service provider, they're not expecting us as a CCNA level to be configuring service provider routers. Okay, Not to say that if you work for a service provider, you can't be, because in a lot of cases, that's usually what they have you do. <laughs> but their broader audience is not the service provider. Their broader audience are or consists of individuals who are working for IT organizations who are having to interface with a service provider in order to bring up a serial link or bring up a router at a for, you know remote location. So that's the scenario that they want us to basically during the CCNA they need we need to demonstrate that we're capable of doing these things. That's the whole point of it. So um, that is PPP over Ethernet. We're going to go ahead and go take a look at the configuration for that. Again, any questions about PPP in general, um, go ahead and ask those. But let me let me pull up the routers here. Let's see if our routers are updated. I don't think. No, wait, wait. I think they're there. All right. In fact, I think I might have lost. Yeah, that's random. I lost router three, router two. To timeouts. I know you can see router one right now, but I've got router three and router one. Okay, router two is back up. We're on router one. All right. So um, I have made actually, let's flip over to router three, make sure. Okay, good. So on router three, that was weird. Um, Where'd it go? There we go. On router three, so actually, <laughs> I forgot to show the um, the topology. Let me just show you the topology real quick. So for those who weren't here last week, this will uh, this this will be good because we're using the same topology that we used last week. So pull that up right here. So we have these um, three routers. Let me just be give myself the ability to draw here. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into the PPP over ethernet client. So I already have the host configuration on router one. And so we just need to apply the configuration that Cisco wants us to know to router three. And that'll bring it up on this subnet. Now, again, keep in mind that usually I have, for example, dot one configured on the host side and dot three. Yeah, because router three. So router three would have dot three on its side. But because it's PPP over ethernet, we're going to have this get negotiated. And then we'll take a look and see what gets assigned. So now that we've seen the topology, <laughs> let's flip over to router three. Um, and I need to pull it up. There we go, looks like we're good. So, um, and I need to make sure that, this is not something that I can figure every day, believe it or not. <laughs> PPP over ethernet is, it's, it's hard to find in practice where people are using it, but it is something that we should always consider. So um, like I mentioned, we're going to configure that interface dialer. That is, yeah, that's good. So we're, we'll make this interface dialer one and we need to assign it a pool. This is kind of like a, um, think of it like, like a sub interface, you know, on a router, how you can make sub interface gig zero slash zero dot 10, but that doesn't automatically make VLAN 10 attached to that sub interface. 
So you'd have to also specify, so even though it's dot 10, you have to specify VLAN 10, same thing. We're making it interface dialer one, but we have to actually bind a pool ID to it. So we're gonna go ahead and bind a pool, a pool ID to it. Um, we'll get to that, get back to that in a moment. Um, encapsulation is point-to-point -point protocol. And this is where, again, we specify that the IP address is negotiated. Now, one thing I didn't mention, and I don't know if they're going to ask anything about this on the exam, but we typically want to be careful of MTU, okay? Because there is a an eight bit, or I'm sorry, an eight byte header to point to point protocol, and we run the risk of exceeding that. So, um, what we want to do is specify MTU 1492 because that's 1500, which is the default. Subtract the eight. What that means is it's going to prevent anything from going out onto that link that doesn't have, um, or, but it will fragment, let's put it that way. <laughs> Layer three traffic will fragment at the 40, 1492 point rather than 1500. Because if we allow, we, we allow a 1500 byte packet to come in, it'll add the eight bytes on top of that, send it out, and it'll actually get dropped on egress because the router says the MTU has been exceeded. So um, I guess from a CCNA perspective, we should understand what the maximum transmission unit is. That's what MTU stands for. Um, and also, by the way, understand that there's two different behaviors for MTU. If we exceed a layer three MTU, like I just described, we can fragment it. That's what IP is capable of doing for us as our network layer protocol. But when it hits a layer two interface, Ethernet has no way of fragmenting and of course, um, we are here sitting here talking about HDLC and PPP as well. Neither of those do either. So we have no way of fragmenting at layer two. So if we don't fragment at layer three, for whatever reason, like in this case, and we exceed the MTU at layer two, it will just get dropped. And okay, that's something that doesn't occur to, I know it didn't occur to me until about five years into my networking <laughs> career. So don't feel bad if you didn't understand that because a lot of network engineers don't that there's two different MTUs out there, layer two and layer three. So Cisco doesn't expect us to know it at the CCNA level or have a full grasp of that. So don't worry about that. Just a you know, little tidbit of information. Okay, so next up, we're going to get onto the interface. So in this case, again, this is a weird lab environment. I'm running Cisco's viral in the background. So it's a weird interface, it's gig three. <laughs> not gig three slash anything or zero slash three or, or something. It's just interface gig three. That's okay. We're all good. Um, we don't need an IP address on this interface. We're simply going to do PPPOE dash client. And then it's going to give us the option here to specify the dial pool number. Because again, we can't reference the individual. I mean, I guess they could have made, I don't know. Either way, <laughs> we, I don't know why Cisco did it this way, but this is how they did it. We can't reference this interface dialer one. We have to reference the pool ID, pool one. Okay, so we're going to say, oops, dial pool number one, specify that. And there we go, we're already seeing it come up. So everything came up just fine. This virtual access interface is, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not worth explaining at this point. Um, it ties back to that virtual template interface on the server side or on the host side, but we don't need to worry about that. All we need to worry about is do show IP int brief, and let's see if our dialer interface has, indeed it does have an IP address. And look at that, we got dot three, which is funny because the pool actually started at dot two, but hey, it must've been like, oh, router three, you want dot three. Let's see if we can ping across that now. Do ping 192.168.13.1 should be the other side of that, and we can. So we are effectively communicating right now through point-to-point -point protocol over ethernet. And that's as simple as the configuration needs to be for it. So fortunately, it's not too complicated. Um, here's a cool, let me let me see if I can remember. Do show, is it history or is it, is it CLI history? CLI history? Uh, maybe it is do show history. Let's, let's get all the way out. Show history. Oh. Oh, now let's do it. Do show history. There we go. All right. <laughs> it's a cool command um, that I obviously I don't use very often. So, um, but we can actually see the history of our commands here. So 
what we did was we did the dialer pool. Uh, we made that interface and then dialer pool one, encapsulation PPP, IP address negotiated MTU. So these are the four commands right here that we needed to um, configure underneath that dialer interface. And then we got onto the physical interface and simply specified which dialer interface to communicate with. And the dialer brought up that virtual access interface, which again is just under the hood complicated stuff. We don't need to worry too much about that. And we established that connection. So let's come back to our drawing here and pick a different color. So what's effectively happening now is we've got Ethernet running. Now let me draw it up here. We have our IP address, layer three, happening. So our IP address at layer three. And then at layer two, we have Ethernet. So this would be where our MAC address lives. That's all still happening just fine. But then we're actually injecting in here that eight bytes of PPP information. And because of this now, it, you can think of it almost as a tunnel where um, we're, we're writing the point-to-point -point protocol through the ethernet um, as, as the underlay. So this point-to-point, -point, uh, think of it as a tunnel interface being sent across like this over PPP. Our IP addresses are attached to the PPP uh, virtual interfaces, that dialer interface or the virtual template interface in the case of router one and we're able to send traffic over that. And by the way, we can configure authentication. So let's go ahead and um, take a look real quick. I wanna show case, let's show case router one's configuration just so you all see it. I think that would be valuable. So if we do a show, let's do a show run here. Okay, so what we have is First of all, this is kind of an oddball configuration, but we have to specify that our point-to-point -point over ethernet group is broadband access or BBA group. Um, we have to specify which virtual template we want to use. Okay, so this is again, kind of like the same thing where we're binding things together. And then ethernet gig three down here and uh, the virtual template. So we create the virtual template interface. Um, we do give it RIP address because we're not doing DHCP on our side but then we specify this test pool or well, whatever pool we want. In this case, I'm calling it a test pool. Um, that is elsewhere in the, con that, can that is elsewhere in the configuration. I might've skipped it. Uh, it might be out after this. Let's see, where is it? It's gotta be here somewhere. There it is. All right. So here we see the, this test pool simply has a range of IP addresses that I've configured. Like I said, it starts with dot two, but hey, we got dot three. So that was cool and then get onto the physical interface and we apply the uh, PPPoE enablement. So more complicated and you don't need to worry about it. I just didn't want it to be like, oh, don't worry about that. I took care of that. <laughs> um, it uses this virtual template interface concept and effectively what it's doing on both sides of the link is it's taking my physical interface and it's putting a virtual interface right behind it. And it's kind of like, again, we've talked about router sub interfaces in the past. So You've got a physical interface that you can normally put an IP address on with a router, but instead we back that up. We put a virtual interface behind it, that sub interface, and allow this to just pass native ethernet into that sub interface. And that allows us to send multiple or have multiple um, IP addresses on a single interface with a router. But as I said, it's just sort of that same concept, very similar. Okay. So not the most exciting of topics, but one that again, Cisco wants us to know. Um, still looking for questions. Doesn't look like we have any. So y'all feel free to chime in with whatever. Um, you wanna see something, you wanna ask a question. Okay, so moving on to maybe more exciting things. Let's talk about BGP. So find the right button there. Okay, yep, that looks good. So I'm gonna pull the topology down. We'll start with a new board. There we go. BGP, I gotta say, BGP is fun, y'all. <laughs> um, if BGP intimidates you, I get it. Um, it. It has intimidated me in the past, but it's a cool protocol. Um, the more you learn about it, the more it makes sense. And 
as much as anything, I, I think it's just, we just don't get to put our hands on it much unless you happen to work for a service provider or a large enterprise that uses BGP on your network. But the generally speaking, the purpose of BGP is to take domains, which maybe we're running an EIGRP domain and maybe we're running another EIGRP domain here and then maybe we're running an OSPF domain here. And it's taking these domains, if we think about the internet, We've got millions of domains, right? I mean, we've got like Cisco it has their own network. That's a domain. Um, Microsoft has a domain and Google has a domain and Amazon and all these. So, so we think of those big, you know, big companies, but then guess what? I, I'm running a domain here. I've, I've got my own little world in my house, <laughs> with my probably 13 connected devices inside my home. That's a domain. And so we have all of these domains throughout the entire internet and BGP's job is to allow all of these domains to communicate with each other. And so we're, we're kind of in a way sitting between domains from you know, BGP's perspective and we're, we're linking these, these together. You can think of it like that in a way. Which is why with EIGRP and OSPF, we see a lot of similarities between those two protocols. We saw last week how, regardless of the methodology, the goal was to simply fill the routing table with routes, which, you know, is arguably BGP's job too. So how does it differ from that? Well, EIGRP and OSPF, is, they're designed to have full working knowledge of the network, as, as full as possible. You know, we, we do route summarization and we do some things. You know, we saw with OSPF, we can have multiple areas and, that's, and, and such. Um, but, but their job is to make everything what we call fully converged. That means any IP address within a domain, like here, any IP address here can get to any IP address within that domain. Now the OSPF domain looks like it's smiling, so that's great. But <laughs> we're, we're communicating between any, any host or any IP address within that domain. That's OSPF's job in this case, is to keep that domain talking internally. But BGP... Um, Oh, and one, one more comment on that. OSPF also wants to know everything about that domain. So it, it's one of its biggest focuses, EIGRP included, by the way, these interior gateway protocols. That's what we call these, IGP. EIGRP and OSPF are interior gateway protocols. One of their biggest goals is convergence time. Okay, We want to get back up and running as fast as possible. And so if one little link goes down over there, then I know that I've got to um, send my traffic that way. And, and instead of sending it that way, I'm gonna send it that way now. And I'm gonna try to, to get that up and running within 10 milliseconds or, or whatever my time frame is. So that's, that's the focus of that. Now, can you imagine if the internet was such that, oh, a link went down, we have 10 millisecond convergence around that? I mean, that'd be great, but that just wouldn't scale. You know, BGP's goal, when we're talking about BGP, we want scalability. We want to be able to uh, scale up, wow, scalability, there we go. And uh, you can't read it anyways, but yeah, I totally misspelled that. So <laughs> um, let me just write it where y'all can see it. BGP's goal is scale, can I ever say, okay, good. Scalability, and I spelled it right this time. I spelled it right last time too, because you know, prove otherwise. So the goal of that is to say, hey, you know what? eventually we're going to get you there. And if if something goes down, yes, we want to converge quickly. And we're not talking like hours. Like we're, we're talking like maybe minutes, maybe maybe even seconds, um, but just not milliseconds. Not, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not breaking into that sub-second category with BGP. The other thing too is we know this concept of metrics. We, we've talked about that, that, you know, hey, if OSPF has a network in some fashion, and we have all of these costs, right? Where it's like, this is five and this one's 10 and this is one and this is seven. And is it faster to send it this way? Or is it faster to send it that way? And well, we add the links up and one plus seven is eight and 10 plus five is 15. So we're going to send it out the eight path every time. That's all based on bandwidth utilization. OSPF's cost is based on bandwidth. And so in theory, the fastest bandwidth is the path on the left that I just drew there. But with, um, uh, with BGP, we're not really thinking about that necessarily. 
we're, we're thinking about the fact that I don't know what's inside each of these domains. So I'm just going to treat them all the same. So I might have really fast paths through this EIGRP domain, but hey, if I'm, you know, uh, well, we're, we're, oh yeah. So if I'm trying to get to this EIGRP domain from something over here, and I've got links to both, that didn't come out very well. Yeah, well, either way, um, BGP isn't going to think about the fact that, okay, here's what I'm, here's, here's, we're trying to get to the OSPF domain. Let's say that. We're trying to get to OSPF domain. And it's not necessarily going to know which of those two domains is faster to get through because one of those domains might be Cisco and the other one might be Amazon. And who has the better network, Cisco or Amazon? And we might assume it's Cisco, but hey, you know what? Um, we, we can't know that. And so BGP doesn't by default look at bandwidth, for example. Um, there's a lot of other things that it looks at. Number one, by the way, interestingly, is it looks at hop count. It looks at what we call the AS path. Every one of these domains is called an autonomous system or an AS. And BGP is paying special attention to the list of autonomous systems that I have to go through in order to get to a final destination. So if I know I've got two hops either way to get to that OSPF domain, well, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I'll just pick one based on another criteria, set of criteria. Uh, because that's going to be a tie. So we don't, we don't, we can't necessarily know what's happening inside one of those domains. All right. So let's, that's good for theory. Let's start to make this a little more practical. So one of the biggest curiosities or differences between BGP and these IGPs is the fact that BGP neighborships are not going across a broadcast. So when I spin up EIGRP or OSPF and I activate, remember we talked about last week, for those who are with us, we talked about activating a link using those network statements. As soon as I activate it, it's sending broadcast, technically multicast traffic, but effectively it's broadcasting it. So we're sending multicast traffic back and forth and we discover each other and we form a neighborship. And, and that's cool and that's exciting, but that's not how BGP operates. BGP uses a TCP stream. And so we're actually sending a packet in theory through the network to get to my neighbor. Couple of things about that. Number one, um, if I'm gonna send a TCP um, connection request to somebody, what do I have to know? I have to know where I'm sending it. So, there is no longer an automatic discovery of neighbors within BGP. And the assumption here is again, that I might have a domain here with routers and I might just be sending a BGP request neighborship between routers at the edge of the domain because they're part of a greater BGP, well, really, they're, they're part of the internet, right? And so we're going to be communicating between these autonomous systems and then I'm gonna send my next connection to the other side of my autonomous system, which is running EIGRP in here. Yeah, that might be a little bit complicated, but so stick with me on this. But understand that this is running as a direct TCP stream, which means that when I use the neighbor command, which yes, there's a neighbor command, I have to specify what my neighbor's IP address is. So I have to know what that IP address is. Let's take that a step further. If I'm going to, in the configuration, it's one thing for me uh, in the configuration, okay, I've got two routers, they're directly connected. Okay, I'm gonna send, you know, enter this neighbor command on both sides and they'll become neighbors because they're right next to each other because they're in my lab environment. That's great. But what about this scenario over here? What about this scenario? What about the fact that I'm sending a TCP request all the way across the network? What, what does that imply if I'm sending it all the way across the network? Well, it implies what we just said before a moment ago, use that word, that fully converged network. That network is fully converged, which means that we're probably running another routing, routing protocol underneath BGP in this case. So how does my router here know where that router is down here? However we do it is fine. It could be static routing, it could be EIGRP. It could be um, OSPF, whatever it is, 
um, that is uh, that is how we, you know, we just have to have a protocol running. All right. So, um, let's see here. So, um, neighbor, we're gonna do the neighbor command. Okay. So, um, the, by the way, this is, this runs TCP port 180. Um, what else do we want to cover before we go do some configuration? Oh yes, um, one other thing, and we're going to see this. Um, this is pretty important. Remember, we talked about those network statements as well. So those network statements that on EHGRP and OSPF, we talked about that. Those network statements, interestingly, um, they didn't advertise a network. Do you remember what we said that they did? We talked about how they activate an interface, which is kind of sounds weird. But when I have OSPF, let's say I'm configuring OSPF up here, and I use that network statement. And that network statement happens to include an IP address on that interface. Well, OSPF is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to start sending those multicasts out, like we talked about, trying to form a neighborship. But number two, it's going to actually at, uh, advertise that network into the OSPF domain. And so that actually, in a weird way, it ends up doing what I thought it was doing. It ends up giving, delivering that network into the OSPF, like advertising that within OSPF. But um, it does it in a roundabout way. It does it by looking at all of its interfaces, saying, hey, is there anything in my interfaces that you know that network statement falls under? And then it activates those interfaces. Well, with BGP, it's, uh, it's back to what we thought it was going to do. This network statement actually advertises networks. Because again, we don't have this concept now of all of my neighbors are directly attached. We're all um, communicating over uh, multicast, right? We don't, we don't have that anymore. So what we really have happening instead is we are forming these TCP neighborships. We're forming neighborships. And then we're going to advertise a network across it. So we're going to tell it, hey, I have these networks. So this network statement, whatever it is, let's say it's, um, let's just say 192.168.1.0. And then really what we want to do is a slash 24, but the syntax is curious. I have to say the word, got to make sure it's not being covered up here. I have to say the word mask, and then I can specify 255.255.255.0. This is how I can tell my BGP neighbors that I have that network attached. And so what we do is when we configure, what the router is going to do is when we configure that network statement, that router is going to check its routing table and say, do I have that route? And if I do have that route, then I will advertise that to my neighbor, all my neighbors. So um, that, is, that is how we're going to configure BGP. Now, I want to point something out here, and that's that Cisco only says that we need to configure eBGP. So what is this eBGP? Well, let's talk about that for a moment. So this diagram right here is going to be useful for us. Let me change colors here. So this diagram here on the left shows that we have three different autonomous systems, and we have neighborships between autonomous systems and we have neighborships within autonomous systems. A neighborship within an autonomous system is called internal BGP. This right here is an iBGP neighborship. This connection right here is between autonomous systems. That's what we call external BGP. That is eBGP. So Cisco wants us to understand, as part of, if we're going to be a CCNA, if we're going to go after the CCNA, they're expecting, Cisco is expecting us to understand how to form eBGP neighborships. Why? Why does Cisco care only about that? Um, the reason is because it comes back to the PPP thing we just talked about. Um, they're assuming that most of the CCNAs that are out there are going to be um, more or less configuring connections to service providers. So if I get a router in, let's say I I work for an organization, maybe this is you, you, you work for an organization, you're an IT shop, 
If I'm in an IT shop and I'm going to bring up, let's say I work for a medical clinic and I'm going to spin up a new site. And I, as part of that process of building a new building, I'm calling up the service provider and saying, hey, I need to be part of whatever network you got. Maybe it's MPLS. If we, for those who have heard of that, we'll talk about that here momentarily. And I need you to um, connect me, connect that remote branch to my headquarters. So what we have is we have an uh, you know HQ, and we have my branch down here, and the service provider is going to be here in the middle. Well, a lot of times what the service provider is going to do is, and I've already got this connection to the service provider from headquarters, I'm gonna spin this connection up, and this will be an eBGP connection. So because of this, because a lot of times when I'm bringing up new circuits, um, T1s, Metro Ethernet, well, Metro Ethernet maybe, usually not. Um, MPLS is, a, is a big, the biggest one, where when I'm bringing up a new MPLS circuit, then it's probably going to be an eBGP connection that I have to make to my service provider. So this is where, again, the point-to-point -point concept, if we are connecting to a service provider, we need to know the client-side configuration. This is the exact same concept. So let's go saying you just need to know the client-side configuration, which is going to be eBGP. So let's, um, I think at this point we've covered everything. So let's go ahead and go do this configuration. Let's see this in action. So we're gonna flip over to, let's see if router one is still alive. It looks like it is. Barely. There we go. Okay, router one, and we'll make this connection to router, I lost router two again. All right, router two. All right, now I got router two back. We'll flip to that in a moment. So, router one. Um, do a quick, uh, uh, let's do a quick topology check, actually. I wanna make sure that we understand what we're doing here. So our topology, now we're working on the left side here. So we're gonna configure uh, here. We're gonna configure BGP, and again, eBGP, between router one and router two. So it's almost like we're assuming here that router two is part of an autonomous system number or autonomous system. We'll call this autonomous system number, yeah, it's router two. Let's just call it 222. And up here, we're part of autonomous system number 111. All right, so we have eBGP, eBGP, external border gateway protocol. <laughs> eBGP, that is hard to say as it turns out. Uh, we're going to configure that between routers one and router two, or routers one and two. Router one and router two are part of the same network right here. But we want to make a BGP connection. Well, I don't know. Okay, not sure why I said it that way. We're going to make a BGP connection from this interface to this interface right here. The good news and the simple part of this lab environment is routers one and two can already reach each other on these interfaces. If I go ping right now, they'll be able to because they're directly attached. If, for example, I wanted to take this link down and send it over here, well, then I'd probably need a routing protocol running because router one wouldn't know where router two is. But that's not the case here. We're just keeping it simple, focused on BGP configuration. So let's go ahead and configure that. And the goal is just like last week with EIGRP and OSPF, the goal is I want to share loopback zero and loopback zero. I want to share these loopback IP addresses with one another over BGP. So we should see a BGP route show up after all of this. So let's do that. Go back to router one first. And we're going to do a config T. Everybody can see this all right. There we go. Um, config T and we're going to make a router BGP and we said we'd use autonomous system 111. So this is the time to specify the autonomous system number. All right, and again, we have to use that neighbor command. So we're going to specify neighbor and then the IP address 192.168.13, nope, wait, 12, yes, not 13. 12.2 is my neighbor. And it's expecting one other parameter here. It needs to know is this an eBGP configuration or an iBGP configuration? And if it is eBGP, then it would need to know it's autonomous system number. So we kind of knock all of this out by saying what the remote autonomous system number is. So we use this remote-as command 
and say that router two is in two, two, two. There it goes. I don't know why I was slow there. Two, two, two. So we'll hit enter. So I've now con configured my uh, neighbor command on router one. Let's go over to router two and we'll do the same thing. Config T, router BGP 222, we said. And we'll do the neighbor command. Neighbor 192.168.12.1 remote autonomous system is, in this case, the other guy, router one, is 111. So when we do this, ideally, we're going to see that this comes up. Let me make sure, by the way, and it will, BGP does take a little longer. Oh, yep, there it goes. So don't need to worry about that. I just thought in the, while we were waiting that I'd make sure that we actually can ping each other, but we, we can. So our neighborship is now up. Now, if I uh, do a show IP route BGP, I don't have anything. It, it would list something here if we had a BGP routes. The reason we don't have any BGP routes is because, oh, whoops, I was on the wrong, sorry, here. Show IP route BGP. Let's do a do in front of that. There we go. So it would we would see if we had a BGP route here, if we had it. So the reason we don't have BGP routes is because neither of these routers have any idea that they're supposed to be injecting routes. So, and, and in a way it's no different than EIGRP because, you know, EIGRP, OSPF, we have to put those neighbor, those network commands out there in order to activate those interfaces and inject those subnets into the interior gateway protocol. With BGP, it's a little different. Again, we're actually looking at we're looking at very specific network IDs, and I'll I'll demonstrate that here. So let's go ahead and inject our loopback interfaces. Again, we're on router two right now. Yes. Okay. Good. So we're on router two, and I'm going to specify. Let's see here. Um, network. Actually, hold up. Cisco did make a change with the um, with the configuration of BGP. We have this concept of address family. I will come back to the whiteboard and explain this, but for now, what we need to do is specify address family IPv4. Okay. The we will come back and look at it a little more detail, but an address family is there because BGP is not a routing protocol. BGP is an information protocol. We can specify we we can pass all kinds of different information across BGP. We don't just have to send IPv4 routes. So for example, OSPF version two is what we use for sharing IPv4 addresses via OSPF. But we couldn't just change OSPF v2 to carry IPv6 addresses. So OSPF v version two was no good. So we came up with OSPF version three. And that is purpose built for IPv6 addresses. In the same way though, IPv, OS, OSBF v3 cannot share IPv4 addresses. Boy, that is getting, that is getting hard to say. <laughs> um, BGP is one protocol to rule them all. It can not only send IPv4 addresses, it can send IPv6 addresses. It can send, well, take a look here. Address dash family question mark. These are all the things that it can send. Now, a lot of this has to do with MPLS, where we, we see these via VPN comments down here, we can actually share VPN information. It's, it uses VRFs and it's more complicated than what we need to worry about with CCNA. But we do see that I could specify IPv6, for example, and it's one BGP autonomous system number to rule them all. Cause that's how BGP is supposed to work. It's supposed to be, you know, Cisco owns an, I, an autonomous system number. Well, they're not going to own one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. They're just going to own one. So BGP carries IPv4 and IPv6 as much as we want. So a little more explanation than I intended to give you up front, but we'll, uh, you know, it's important that we understand what's happening. So address family IPv4. And next we're going to specify those networks. So we say network 192.168. Oh, what, 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 what am I doing? We're specifying the loopback interfaces. So let's do 2.2.2. .2 .2 dot zero. And then again, we need that keyword mask. And I, and by the way, you'll notice also, it's truly a mask. It's not a wild card. It's a network mask. And I think what's one of the reasons why Cisco set, has that word mask in there is to make sure that you know that there's an actual network mask uh, to follow. 
So we'll inject that into BGP. Now router two understands that I should advertise that network to the rest of my BGP neighbors. So the first thing it's going to do is say, do show IP route. Do I have 2.2.2.0 slash 24? Do I have that in my routing table? And look at that, I do. 2.2.2.0 slash 24. And um, yeah, well, we'll get to the local routes in a moment. So I do have that. So what that tells me is I should actually get that route now in my routing table on router one. So let's flip over to router one. And we're on the, let's just do, do show IP route. And you know what? It's right here with the B on the side. I'm going to make it a little cleaner and say, do show IP route BGP. And there we go. Now we see the one route that we're worried about. So I should be able to ping that. Do ping 2.2.2.2. And I can ping router 2's loopback address. So that network statement works a little differently, but it also works a little bit the same. We don't need to stress about it too much with the CCNA. We just need to understand how to input those network statements and bring the neighborship up. All right. Um, next, we're going to do it in reverse. So I want to demonstrate, though, that this network mask matters. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to go into that address family sub configuration prompt on router one. And I'm going to say um, network. <clears throat> now, this is also a slash 24. So I'm simply going to add the slash 32. 255, 255, 255, 255. Now, what this is saying is that, hey, router, if you've got 1.1.1.1 slash 32, this is slash 32 route, if you have that, then go ahead and advertise it out. Now, this command would have worked in OSPF because in OSPF, I have an interface with that IP address, slash 32. We would use a wildcard mask with OSPF. We'd say 0, 0, 0, 0 instead of 4255s. But it, the command would, would have worked. And here, what we should see, do show IP route BGP, is that we still don't have any, oops, sorry. There we go, router two. <laughs> router two, we, I, this command I just ran, do show IP route BGP, and we have no BGP routes. The reason is because if I look at the routing table on router one, so do show IP route, what I have is one dot, one dot one, wait, 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 hold up, do show run int loopback zero. Oh, whoops, that is a slash 32. Well, then I, that was a mistake. <laughs> that was supposed to be a slash 24. That's what I get sometimes for, okay. So let's go back and take one quick look here. So do, so now the question is, all right. So 1.1.1.1 with a slash, that actually should work. That actually should work because we have that as a, uh, as a slash 32. Oh, but it's in the routing table. No, that's, that should be right. 1.1.1.1. One. 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 Hmm. That is not showing up. Well, let's do some troubleshooting. Why not? So network 1.1, one. One. let's just do the, what they have up there, the 255, uh, whoops, mask. We're just gonna do the one. Let's see if we can make this work. It'd be a little uh, little adventure. So let's advertise 1.0.0.0. Which one are we on right now? Yeah, okay. Whoops. Okay, so that's not quite working. I'm not sure if it's just the fact that it's a slash 31 on a loopback. There are some different rules for loopback addresses within Cisco. So we've got the slash 24. If I look at router two, yeah, see router two is a slash 24. So if I get onto the loopback, let's just change that right now. Let's just see what happens if that brings it up. Let's do 1.1.1.1 .1 .1 .1 
and then we'll specify that it's a slash 24 instead. So now we're on, sorry, I gotta make sure I'm doing a better job of switching <laughs> windows here. I switch it on my screen and then I don't realize that the stream is not, doesn't pick up on my window movement, so I have to manually switch it. All right, so let's take a look now back at router two and do a, uh, let's take a look at that. Ah, see, something's up here where we're not actually getting routes. So let's, this is a good command. I'm just going to cancel out of that and show IP BGP. So we are only getting this network 22220 slash 24 within the BGP world. Um, in fact, if I flip back to router one, this is a great command for troubleshooting, show IP BGP. We've got the same thing on both sides. The problem typically has to do with the, if we can't, if we don't have a next hop to, to get there, uh, to, you know, for example, it's showing that this next hop is 192.168.12.2. I know that my next hop to get to this network is router two. So if I struggling for whatever reason to get a BGP route to get into my routing table, that usually has to do with um, this next hop issue where I'm like, maybe I'm getting the network advertised, but I don't understand what its next hop is. Um, so, I mean, this is definitely going beyond CCNA and I want to make the best, most use or the <laughs> best use of everybody's time who's studying for the CCNA, but troubleshooting can be pretty valuable too. So I think I'm going to give this another couple minutes here and see what we can do with it. Cause I also don't want to raise my hands and give up. So let's look one more time, show run interface loopback one or loopback zero. So we have this 1.1.1.1. I don't think I've actually, uh, let me see, do our show run section BBP. Have I done the slash 24 yet? Okay, I haven't actually done the slash 24. So that's probably what's holding it up. Config T router BGP 111 address family IPv4. Let's get that network statement right. 1.1.1.0 mask three 255s. Now let's see. Uh, mask three 255s. Now let's see if that shows up in the BGP table. Ah, see now it's showing up. And this next hop zero, all zeros means that this is me. So this is coming from me, which is good. And um, by the way, these are some other BGP, call it parameters. Um, remember we talked about that AS path or the hop count. Well, we see that in order to get to the, to this 2222 network, well, 2220 slash 24, I have to go from myself, that's what the I is, it starts from the right, and then I go to um, this 222 autonomous system number in order to get there. So I can actually see the whole path to get across a BGP domain, call it. It's really not a domain anymore. It's more like the internet because <laughs> it's a bunch of BGP autonomous systems. It shows me the path to get there. Okay, so if we switch over to router two, we should see that show up now. And we do, we get the 1.1.1.0 slash 24. All right, I'm gonna try it one more time to get that slash 32 to work because it's possible it's just a weird Cisco rule, but I also don't like losing. <laughs> so um, we're gonna get onto that interface and we're gonna make that a slash 32 again, even though that was totally a mistake. And if I hadn't made that typo, then we wouldn't have uh, gone down this rabbit trail. So back to router one here, I just changed it to a slash 32. Do show uh, run interface, let's just confirm. And I suspect it has to do with the routing table entry. Well, no, because it is a connected route. I know these local routes don't really connect, they don't count for anything as far as BGP is concerned, but the fact that it's connected as a slash 32 it's bothering me that that's not working. So we'll try this one more time. Do show run section BGP. And I already have that specific mask in there. So if I do a show IP BGP. Okay, now it's showing up. It's slash 32. So let me go over to router two. Do show IP route BGP. Oops. Show IP route BGP. <laughs> Okay, so we're not getting it, but let's see if show IP BGP, let's see if it's showing up. Ah, here we go. It's giving a rib failure. That's what that R means, see, rib failure. 
What that means is it's having, like, even though it's hearing about it from its neighbor, it's not able to get there. Actually, usually what R means is it has a, oh, <laughs> I'll finish that thought. Usually what a little R means is that there it's being overridden. Like it can't install it into the routing table because something is overriding it. And I betcha, I betcha I had a, um, I had a, uh, <laughs> I had a static route in there earlier when I was messing around with things, and I bet it's still there. Let's do show IP, oops, show IP route. Let's see if that static route is still there. All right, so earlier when we were looking at this, I bet if my eyes had just wandered over to the left and seen, I bet that static would have jumped out. So yeah, we actually have a static route. So let's do this. Let's go here and we'll get rid of that. So no IP route 1.1.1.1. Incidentally, the reason I had that route in there was because I was trying to form the BGP neighborship to the loopback interfaces. And um, even though you can do that, because as we talked about earlier, you have to be fully converged. And by default, router two didn't know where router one's loopback was, so I gave it a static route and it worked great. But anyways, so this obviously is interfering with things. So let's just do that. No IP route 1.1.1.1. So we should now do show IP route BGP, come on, let's see it. Come, aha, there it is. And it is a slash 32. So there's nothing wrong with the slash 32. Um, this, is, this is actually a good troubleshooting exercise, as it turns out, um, because we got to explore a couple of things. First of all, we do absolutely have to make sure that the masks are in alignment. We just saw that with router one, that when this section of command up here, I did not have the slash 24. So even though I had this statement, which would have worked in an EIGRP scenario, the slash eight version did not work because it's not activating interfaces. If that had simply activated loopback zero, loopback zero would have worked and we, we would have been up and running. <clears throat> but it's not activating interfaces. It is looking for actual networks in its own routing table. So when we did this command right here, that put it into the BGP table. We also saw what that, you know, this concept of the BGP table, this command right here is very useful. Show IP BGP. This gives me every network that I'm aware of, whether or not it gets installed into the routing table. So once I saw, once, once we see this network show up in the routing or show up in the BGP table, we know at least BGP is working. Something else was stopping it from working. And two things can happen. One can be that, well, the next hop, um, I can't get to the next hop for it. So it'd be like saying, I don't know where this IP address is. Um, pretty difficult to have that scenario in a lab where they're directly attached. <laughs> um, but this can happen in real life all day long. So be aware of that. The second thing that we saw was that back on router two, scroll up a little bit. This little R right here is a giveaway. When we have a route in the BGP table, a rib failure, even though that sounds dire, like the rib is failing. Eh, the rib is the routing information base. That doesn't sound good at all. All it's saying is that BGP is being overridden. So remember those administrative distances we talked about? eBGP has a very low administrative distance as an administrative distance of 20. So it beats OSPF, which is 110. It beats EIGRP, which is 90. It beats RIP, which is 120. It beats everything. I, I think that's that right. OSPF is 110. RIP is 90. Or, uh, I'm not saying it right. <laughs> EIGRP is 90, OSPF is 110, RIP is 120. There we go. Um, so EIGR, EBGP should win all the time. The only time it's going to lose in 99% of cases is if there's a static route that is overriding what it's trying to install into the routing table. In this case, we had a static route that was overriding it from the beginning. So definitely shot myself in the foot a little bit, but at the same time, I guess, I guess we'll just say that I, I planned this whole troubleshooting <laughs> scenario. That's a total lie. I didn't, but hey, you know, troubleshooting makes us better. Um, a great trainer once told me that, you know, when, when you can, you know, a lot of times they say when you can teach it, you really know it. Um, when you can teach it, that's like level, like out of five, that's like level three. Um, Maybe it was level four. I think it was level three. I don't remember what he said level four was, but he said level five is troubleshooting. If you can if you can troubleshoot a technology, that means you are five out of five, you know that technology inside and out. So 
again, fortunately on the CCNA, Cisco's not expecting us to be able to troubleshoot it, but hopefully this at least drove home the point of neighbors and network statements at a minimum. All right. So um, CTO, thanks for joining us. Unfortunately, slash 32 causes a lot of problems on Cisco. We try to bring up an interface um, with it on Cisco. Uh, there, there is a nuance with OSPF where um, there are OSPF network types and we don't have to worry about that for CCNA. I don't believe, double check the blueprint. Um, I don't remember seeing it on there last week, but a loopback interface defaults to the loopback um, OSPF network type. And that can cause some weird behavior when you're trying to, you know, basically it shows up as a slash 32 in your network, even though it might not be. So if you want it not to be, you need to get on there and, and change it to OSPF network type um, broadcast or, or what have you. So, um, so I know, I know about that, but I don't, I definitely in my mind was wondering, you know, Hey, is it, is it because it's a slash 32? It didn't end up being that way. Um, I also wonder when I'm on emulated equipment, whether it's the equipment, you know, it's, it's an emulation, it's not a real router. So, um, I wondered about that, but I hate to go down that path because that just seems like an excuse sometimes. All right. So any more thoughts or questions on BGP? It does not look like it. We got about 20 minutes. Um, let's take a look here at our blueprint. So we have covered 3.1 and 3.2. We talked about point-to-point um, -point protocol, PPP, OE, client side. Again, the things that we weren't able to do tonight, um, like we didn't go down the path of authentication, for example, but you know, just, just do some Googling on some good configurations. We just don't have time to do everything, unfortunately. Um, there, there's some great, it, it's, it's not that bad. I mean, adding local authentication is like two more lines. Um, 3.6 we covered. So it's configure and verify single homed branch connectivity using eBGP IPv4, limited to peering, which is that neighbor that we just talked about, and route advertising using the network command only. So those are the two things we need to understand. And the biggest two things again are that neighbors are uh, across a TCP connection, so they have to have routes to each other to begin with, and that that network statement has to match a route that is in the routing table. So, I could see them, for example, I could see them on the CCNA ask, showing you a um, like a picture of the routing table and a picture of the BGP configuration and a topology and saying that these two BGP, you know, neighbors aren't, you know, like I, we're not receiving a route. What's going on? And maybe we look at it and the network statement um, looks like it, it should work, but the network statement is actually wrong like it's it, on the interface it's 2.2.2 slash 24 and they gave the actual full slash 32 or something along those lines um so that could be something that they that they ask so so just keep that in mind um one thing i'll mention just because we have the time i do want to i do want to make sure that i equip you well for um what's to come here let me switch this back to our BGP conversation. Actually, I'll just start with a fresh slate. Okay, so one thing with eBGP, just because Cisco doesn't give us the full details of what all we need to know. So if you're taking the CCNA and we're, we're expecting questions on eBGP, this is important. When we are sending neighbor um, communications <laughs> where we're setting neighbor communications, including the hello packet, the IPv4 TTL field. Anybody know what that is <laughs> off the top of your head for C for CCNA? Um, we're going to want to know what this is. Um, that IPv4 TTL field is time to live. This specifies how many hops we get before the packet is dropped. That TTL on ingress by a router, takes that TTL, subtracts one, and if it subtracts one and it equals zero, it'll drop the packet. Even if it was destined for itself, like even if that packet was, if it's destined for me, and I pick, I bring it in and it's still got that TTL of one, I decrement it, subtract one from it, it's now zero, 
I drop it. Even though it arrived, I drop it. An eBGP packet by default has a TTL set to one because BGP in an eBGP scenario, uh, for whatever reason, not for whatever reason, um, it, usually you're gonna have those routers directly connected. Okay, there, there, there almost can't be additional routers in the way. Like with IBGP, I could have a bunch of routers that you know it goes through this network over to another router and yeah, these two guys, I mean, they're not directly attached. So I'm not going to set the TTL to one because it would get to this router and it would get dropped right away. So with IBGP, I don't set my TTL to one, but with eBGP, the assumption here is that, well, I'm going to a new autonomous system number. You know, again, this is, I'm 1111, he's 2111, he's 222, whatever the situation is. So we're probably directly attached. Okay. In most cases, like what we just did, no problem. You know, we, we did this physical layer three interface to physical layer three interface directly connected. Um, I, I, I totally said that wrong earlier. I apologize because it's actually going to decrement it if it receives it and it's zero. I did say that wrong. So somebody was probably already correcting me in the chat. Eh, I don't see it, but y'all were, I'm sure. <laughs> when you receive a packet and it is already at zero, that's when it drops it. Okay, so forget what I said earlier. Because in this scenario, it works just fine. I send it with one, he decrements it to zero, and then he receives it and it's fine. The problem you can run into is this scenario. I'm gonna have to erase my router marks here to showcase this. Because what can happen a lot is that you want a neighborship to be up even though a link goes down. And so we might actually have two connections. And what if we want to use both of those connections for that one, like I don't need two neighborships. That's going to make my BGP topology more complicated. So what I can do is make these, or, or use a layer three loopback interface here, like I did earlier. Well, not like I did, but like I had, loopback zero. And I can send my neighborship, let me change colors. So I can send my neighbor communications from loopback to loopback. So this is good. And, and I would argue it's the right decision because that way, if this link goes down, I can go out this link. And if this link goes down, I can go out this link. So I've got, I've got two links now and one neighborship. That's awesome. Except for this problem right here because as soon as I move it from one layer three interface to another layer three interface, even though it's on the same router, it's going to decrement it by one. So at this point it becomes zero and gets sent out and that's when it gets dropped. Okay, um, boy, now I'm doubting myself on that one. I think what's happening is that it actually gets decremented here. It depends on how it works. Either way, maybe it's decremented twice. I should have researched that. The point is <laughs> TTL of one is not enough in this situation, okay? Go back and uh, find a good document on TTL. I will as well. <laughs> we'll all be better off for how TTL actually works under the hood. But we see the problem, and so we need to fix the problem. And so Cisco does give us a command that allows us to um, work around this. It's actually called um, EBGP multi-hop ebgp multi-hop increases the TTL. And so if we go back to the configuration, let's say router one. Yeah, let's wake up router one. So let me clear this out. Let's do config T and we'll just say router BGP 111, no neighbor 192.168. What was it 12.2? Yes. No, I can't spell neighbor. No neighbor. Okay, that went down. And instead, we're going to say neighbor one dot, uh, no, turn to router two. So we'll say neighbor two dot two. I'm going to send this to its loopback interface now. Remote dash as two two two. Okay. So now router one is going to send 
um, router, you know, uh, the loopback zero, and we're, we're sending our hellos, our network hellos to the loopback on router two. Um, but there is a problem, which is what we just saw that, you know, this neighborship is not coming up right now because it can't make the, it can't cross the distance. It doesn't have enough TTL to make it there. So we do have a great command, like I said, ebgp, uh, is it hyphenated? Oh, wait. Um, this would be under the, no, I think it should be. Oh, maybe it's under the, oh, it's a, you know, it's the neighbor command. That's right. Neighbor 2.2.2.2 ebgp multi-app. There we go. So this command entering this, Ideally, we'll bring this up. I actually, you know what? I think I got to go to the other side and do it. Nope, I don't, because the other side is good. So, ideally, in, in whatever scenario where we do loop back to loop back, and then we'd have, you know, symmetric configuration. But because I configured multi hop, let me go back to the drawing now. Uh, because I configured multi hop here, this allowed router one to send from this interface to loopback one. So I was able to get through this interface here that was blocking it essentially. All right, so this command, I do not know if that's within the scope. The whole reason I'm bringing this up is if you're gonna take the CCNA here within a, a month or two, they you know, this, this might come up on the CCNA. I do not know. So keep that in mind. Definitely think that through as if you're labbing this up. Um, whatever the scenario is, this is this is definitely a gotcha in the BB, in the BGP world when you're bringing eBGP neighborships up, and so that that can get in your way. Okay, so back to this. With our last ten minutes here, yeah, yeah, we got we got enough time. Let, let's just talk about some of these real quick. In fact, I'm I'm gonna probably spend most of my time on MPLS because that's that's an important one, really in real life. Um, MPLS is a very, still, a, I would argue it's the most common. So we do see a lot of, um, Metro ethernet now being delivered. And so maybe we'll talk, let's just, let's try to talk about both of those. So we have MPLS and we have Metro ethernet. These are two very common WAN technologies. And with, <clears throat> if we notice, you know, I keep flipping over here. See what it says here? We have to configure and verify BGP. We have to configure and verify PPP. What do we have to do for these WAN options? We just have to describe them. Okay, so, so these words matter when you're prepping for the CCNA or prepping for any Cisco test. Pay attention to these words because we don't actually have to configure any of these things, which is good because, you know, they're service provider technologies. But we do need to be able to describe them. So let's describe them. So MPLS is a cool technology, very, very fun, that runs inside of a service provider and it uses what we call label switching. This is what MPL stands for is multi-protocol label switching. It's a really weird concept. It's almost like in an alternate world, if we didn't have IP addresses, um, how would we get communications across networks, large networks? Um, and without going into a whole lot of detail here, the gist of it is if I'm going to send, let's say I've got three routers in a row here and I'm trying to get to a host that's over here, host A from host B, it's backwards, A is usually on the left, but hey, there we go. So B is sending a packet to host A. And when this router receives it, it's going to check its label information uh, table, uh, state, uh, I have to go back and double check the, uh, I, think, I want to say it's LIF, L-I-F. I have to, we'd, we'd need to look it up. Cisco doesn't need us to know any of this. So um, just, just keep this in mind. It's going to check its label database, let's call it, and say, you know, I'm going to send this out with a tag or a label of 13, whatever that is. And what that tag does is it, as far as my, as far as I'm concerned, as far as this router is concerned, uh, if I send that packet out to this other router with a label of 13, it will get to the destination. Okay. So under the hood, what's going to happen is 
we're going to get this packet in with a label of 13. This guy knows, hey, 13 gets translated, well, 13 on the ingress interface. So 13 on the ingress interface gets translated to 22 on the outside interface. So he sends it to 22, sends it out. He knows that 22 means that really I just forwarded out to the network, uh, whatever interface that is. So he strips the tag off the label and sends it to the host. It should, it sounds really weird and it should because like, where's all that information come from? Where are all the labels come from and how do we know how to get there? And that's all stuff, you know, fortunately we don't have to know that. All right. If you want to go for CCIE service provider, you're going to have to know that you have to know exactly how all that works. But fortunately for most of us who don't live in the service provider space, we don't have to understand any of that. Here's what we do need to understand. When I have a two sites, let me just, I don't really, eh, I took up all my real estate. Darn it. All right, we'll just change colors and make it clear here. So when I have two sites, let's say I have my HQ and I have my branch and I need to connect my branch to my HQ. And the oftentimes the best way to do that is by calling up a service provider and saying, hey, I need an MPLS circuit delivered. That MPLS circuit might be a T1, literally like 1.5 megabits per second, give or take. Um, E1 in Europe, same thing. It could be a Metro Ethernet drop-off point. Or it could no, not e Metro Ethernet. They could do an Ethernet handoff is what I mean to say. Um, usually that means that they'll install a router into your data center and hand it off via Ethernet, like we talked about earlier with PPPoE. But either way, MPLS is what they're going to use to ensure that you get to your destination. Um, and so I'm going to have a router here in HQ that connects in. I'm going to have a router here that connects in at my branch site. When I have a T1, what's cool about a T1 is that these routers look like they're directly connected to each other. So I can run OSPF or what have you directly over this link and life is good. These two, I mean, I, I can have dot one on this side and dot two on that side. So those two routers can ping and see each other just fine on a traditional serial connection. But this does not apply to MPLS. MPLS is a layer three domain that is shared with a bajillion other companies because it's a service provider and they're going to make sure that we can service whoever wants to be our customer. So we've got hundreds, if not thousands of other company routers hanging out here and they are going to make sure that that traffic doesn't overlap. Okay. That's what that B mentioned BGP VPN for stuff comes into play. VPN is a private network. So, we have a private network, but it's layer three. What that means is I can no longer say I'm going to put dot one here and dot two here. What that means is dot one goes here and dot two goes here on whatever device this is. Okay, we call it customer premises equipment. No, uh, or um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, CPE device. That means that it's provider owned, but it goes on the customer site usually is how that works. And then on the other side, same thing. So maybe I have a different subnet that's dot one here on the service provider side on that router and dot two here. What's weird about this is I have to exchange routes with my service provider. And like I mentioned earlier, this is usually going to be eBGP. The service provider is going to say, here's my autonomous system number. By the way, here's your autonomous system number. <laughs> They're going to give you one to use. And then they're going to ask you, number one, to form a neighborship with them. And number two, give them whatever networks that you want them to have. Now, in a lot of cases, service providers will offer you, hey, if you pay us more, we'll do all that for you. Um, but that takes a lot of control out of the networking team. So a lot of networking teams don't end up doing that. Um, so, so just understand that that's an option. But you know, if you can understand and just be comfortable with eBGP to the service provider, you're going to save your company potentially a lot of money from having them manage that for you. So it's usually best if you can, can take that into account. So that's what Cisco is going to want us to understand with MPLS is that we don't have to worry about all of this. Again, who cares about all the label switching stuff, right? That's for the service provider to worry about. What I need to worry about is the fact that I will have to make a B, an eBGP neighborship with them and that my routes, I need to exchange routes. I need to send them routes and then they will send that onward to HQ on my behalf and vice versa. I'll receive all of the routes from HQ. Okay. Um, I'll spend two minutes on Metro Ethernet and we'll wrap up. So Metro Ethernet, 
I'll just make this long story short. We don't have to, again, worry about all the technology that's happening under the hood. Metro Ethernet kind of undoes everything we just said. Metro Ethernet is going to form, instead of a layer three domain, it's going to form a layer two domain. And so when I have an HQ router sitting over here and I have a, um, a branch router connected in, they are part of the same layer two domain. So I can have a dot one here and a dot two here and it's all the same subnet. Maybe it's 192.168, it doesn't matter because the service provider doesn't care because it's layer two to them. So I get to define this dot 100 dot zero slash 24. Now why slash 24, why wouldn't I make that smaller? Well, because I can put as many routers on here as I want. So maybe this is branch one, this is branch two, this is branch three. As long as my service provider can get this um, technology, this extension out to all of my branches, they can all be on the same subnet and they can all see each other and directly share routes with one another. So that is what we call Metro Ethernet. Um, yeah, so I, I know we didn't cover everything because as like I said from the beginning, we wouldn't have been able to, but we will need to you know, make sure you study up on VPN technology. There's a lot of different options here like DMVPN and SiteVPN and such. Great technologies that, you know, just find some resources online or, hey, you know, CBT Nuggets. Um, I, I, I train for CBT Nuggets. We've got all kinds of stuff out there. And I've said before, there's a seven-day free trial. So be sure to go sign up for that and use as many of those videos um, taught by, you know, hey, Keith Barker, Jeremy Chara, um, Network Chuck. Some of these guys have been doing this for a long time, and they are really good. So um, take advantage of, of that tool before you go in to take your exam. Um, this is a little more on the basic side, so I didn't want to cover it. Um, point to just understanding what a point to point hub and spoke full mesh topology are, you know, the, go, go to sure check that out and tunnels as well. Um, none of these should, should throw you off too badly, but you know, we just, we need to make sure that we give the appropriate amount of time to each one. So with that, um, I think, I believe next time. We're going to be covering, yeah, this uh, infrastructure services. Uh, in fact, we're splitting this off because QoS is such a big topic. Let me just throw this up one more time. QoS is such a big topic that I didn't want to cover too much at once. So we're actually just going to cover HSRP and probably go down here and talk about ACLs next time. And then QoS will probably be, and not probably, it's going to be its own topic on the other side. Um, incidentally, next week will be our last week before a uh, two week Christmas and New Year's break. So looking forward to seeing everybody here on the 17th uh, for a little bit of fun talking about HSRP. We'll take a nice break, but get right back cracking because um, February is coming up soon. So we gotta be ready for it. We'll hit it, hit the books right away in January. So everybody have a great night. Um, get, some, get some rest and uh, pick up the books again tomorrow and keep studying. Have a good one.